This episode of Hammerlock Podcast with Tyson Dukes is brought to you by Hammerlock Apparel. Visit hammerlockapparel.com today. On today's episode, we talk about the art of subtlety, moves that should make a comeback, and why you should never turn your back on Terry Taylor. It's Tully Blanchard versus Ricky Steamboat. Let's go! What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. I'm Scotty D here with another episode of Hammerlock Podcast with our good, good friend Tyson Dukes. How you been, man? I've been well. I've been really well. It's a sad day, though. It is a sad day, indeed. Uh, we lost another one of our legends of professional wrestling. Doesn't get enough credit as to... Um, none of the family gets as much credit as they do deserve, but Bullet Bob Armstrong uh, recently passed away, so... Uh, we just, it's good to go back. It's good to go back. Today's, uh, you'll know when we get, when we get to it, the match we picked out for you today is pretty awesome. And, uh, I had that in mind when I was thinking Bullet Bob, because Bullet Bob was an old school cat. Uh, he's a great dude. I met him on several occasions and, uh, he's that kind of guy that you just, he, you'd sit around catering and he will talk, he talked to you. And you could ask him anything. He's one of those kind of guys that was always approachable. He was never in a bad mood. And he's always one of those guys that always want to give back, but never pushed his way on guys, which is, um, is hard to find because you could tell that he was very much passionate about his line of work being professional wrestling and loved it so much. And his family gave so much to wrestling. So it was kind of, it's kind of neat to see somebody that is still humble, that he's not going to go out of his way. But if you came up and asked him a question, he'd be all over. It's just a great dude. So, you know, uh, the uh, condolences to the Armstrong family, of course. Um, anyways, that's the end of that. We don't, well, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I just thought it'd be good to, uh, we'll, we'll make this episode. I kind of want to give this episode to Bullet Bob in that regard. Well said. Uh, and let's, uh, yeah, so let's uh, dedicate this episode to Bullet Bob Armstrong. Uh, what do you got for us on the match today? Ooh, Scotty, we got a good one today. We have one of my utmost favorites. And I want to say that a lot because everything that we pick is, a, I'm going to not, I don't want to trash wrestling. I want to show people good, solid professional wrestling to learn from. And this one is no exception. This is one of my very, very favorite matches it's not that long it's only 13 minutes 44 seconds it's between tully blanchard and ricky steamboat in nwa this is nwa days and it sure is one of those 13 minute ones it is by far uh underrated more people need to watch it and i hope with this podcast and hope that we go through it that more people get to see this match it's awesome right on and so if anyone wants to follow along it is uh you can find it on the internet, obviously, if you go to Google and type in Tully Blanchard versus Ricky Steamboat or Steamboat Blanchard, any of the, any combination of that, uh, the video is going to come up. One of the first two or three uh, search results, usually the first one, so you can find it. We're watching one on a channel that is called Crossface Chicken Wing. So if you want to watch the exact one we're watching, they're all about the same length. The particular one we're watching, 13 minutes and 44 seconds. I've got it queued up now. I'm guessing, Tyson, you have that queued up as well. Any final comments before we get her rolling? You know what? I, that's, that's a, it's good that we got a, you gave me the chance to go over this because the, when we start this match, it does have a lockup, which is great. They don't go straight into uh, uh, an attack. But the action is hot and heavy for the first couple minutes. So it's, let's get the, uh, a few points out there before we start this thing. Uh, in this video, what you're going to notice right away is Ricky Steamboat is going to be injured. Uh, his ribs are injured. Uh, I do believe it's from attack. I don't know. I don't know the backstory, but I'm sure it had horsemen written all over it. Because the subtleties in this match, this is, this is about subtleties. We're going to work over subtleties today. We're going to talk about, um, and this is the great match to show for this. This is an over-the-top selling. So you, you're not being over-the-top. You're not, I, I, I equate it to uh, telling a joke. You tell a joke and then everybody laughs, but you, you feel as though you need to explain the joke. Then you ruin the joke. 
in this regard with when it comes to professional wrestling and uh, working the subtleties of either selling or aggression or finding those cue points in the story you don't have to be over the top you don't have to milk it you don't have to be goofy like a lot of them are they all find hard camera and they're very goofy and um, it's just they milk stuff to death now this match you're not going to see that they're not going to milk it they work on subtleties. If you were there live, you probably wouldn't see it, but that it's recorded uh, and you watch it. You can watch this match a hundred times and find something brand new. So being said, once they lock up, you're going to see once they, uh, before the lockup, even Ricky's hands are going to be on his thighs, like uh, a guy that just ran a triathlon and he's exhausted showing that he's got injured ribs. It's hard to breathe. Can't get a full uh, breath of air in. You'll notice that he's very timid about it, but yet also very angry. So I, and it, what I would perceive is that the horsemen have attacked him previously and in, injured his ribs. Because Tully comes out arrogant and cocky, strutting, and actually turns his back to Ricky, which in those days, and I got a funny story about that later, but in those days, turning your back on somebody shows utmost disrespect, especially if you're fighting someone. So... Uh, of course, Ricky attack, goes for the attack, and then Tully turns around and cowers. So that's great heel baby face work in the moments, the very first moments of this match. And then it's just going to pick up from there. So I'm going to leave it at that, and then they're going to get into a lockup into some strikes, but I just want to get that out of the way so I don't have to try to ramble as quick as possible because I want you people to enjoy this as well as watching it. So uh, if you're ready, Scotty, I'm ready. Let's get to it. Right on. So let's uh, let's start. I'm going to count it down from five, and we'll hit play at the same time. So five, four, three, two, one, play. Okay. So right, out, like you're going to see it right away. You see his hands on his thighs, picks up his arms to be checked, but you can tell that there's something wrong. He's not as he's walking towards Tully. He's kind of half staggering. Of course, you can see where he feeds him his back a little bit. Ricky comes after him, and he backs away. Do you see the amount of that subtle work? Now he's grabbing at his hip, showing that his ribs are busted. He's trying to stretch his ribs out to breathe. So that shows you right there. You, that shows intensity, that, like he's injured, but not overdoing it. He's not overdoing it. And bam, we're off to the races. Goes right for those ribs. Obviously, the first shot didn't do the amount of damage that that body shot did. And this back and forth exchange is pure poetry when it comes to pro wrestling. It's not just a form strike back and forth. We're talking about multiple strikes, different areas, body, head, chops, uh, forearms, punches, everything. Ricky, of course, takes the action right to him. Uh, Tully does a great job, like Flair, where they take numerous punches to really show that the baby face is fired up before they bump tries to get out of that ring. He tries to roll out of the ring. Of course, he rolls back in because he's disoriented, and Ricky just gets on him, and, and it just shows great baby face action where he keeps it busy. Uh, he doesn't over bump, but everything looks realistic. It's a great sell, and now they're in a chin lock. Ricky's got a chin lock on him because you got to let that digest. That first minute, minute of action – is really a lot of action. So now they're going to bring it down a little bit so everybody can kind of catch their breath in the crowd. Not so much these guys because they could do this forever. So what do you think, Scott? So, I love, so far, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I love the referee checking underneath to see if he's choking him. Like that's, that's again, another little subtle thing, but he's checking to make sure he's not actually choking him. Uh, you, just, you don't see that that much anymore. It's just beautiful stuff. Obviously, he had that chin lock on. Instead of just going to the ropes, he snap mares him. He holds on to the chin lock, and it gets him to the ropes to break. Heels should break with the ropes as much as possible because it's the easy way out. Baby faces should fight for it. Ah, now at this time right there, did you see that where he gives him that knee lift in the head? Yeah, there's two himself. points to that. There's two points to this. What a great sell by Tully grabbing his face, showing that he really got smashed. But look at that overextended Ricky's ribs. Now his ribs are pulled, or whatever is going on with his uh, his body is like really he took some damage on that by inflicting damage onto Tully. Yeah. So there's two parts to this, Scott. There's two parts. There's the fact that he actually hit him with something solid, and he's selling it. But it also gives him a chance to sell his own ribs and also gives Tully the chance to get up 
from a cell and realize that Ricky is actually hurt. It's absolutely perfect. Oh, he goes right for him. That's so dirty. Right for him. So now, now we're in, we're in the thick of it. We're three minutes in, and we're in the thick of it. Now he's like, he knows that he's hurt, and that's what he's. He notices it. He realizes it. He's like a a shark going after a wounded prey. He's going to circle him, and then he attacks those ribs. Goes for that rib breaker, which I don't see enough of nowadays. We don't see any rib breakers. We see back breakers, but we don't see rib breakers, which looks awesome. And now we're in the heat. We're in the heat right here. And now Tully's just going to just work the ribs over. But I want everybody to notice that uh, as Tully does a lot of rib work and he hits him in the ribs, hits him in the body, hits him in the stomach, uh, that's not the only area he's actually going to attack. And that just shows a little bit more of a veteran savvy. Just because you're working over an area area doesn't mean you have to stick 100,000% to that area because that's exhausting. Like – Opening up a guy by banging up his ribs leaves his guard down so you can get a couple shots in the head. You go to the legs, you go to the arms. You don't have to do that same attack. Right there is a sweet little thing where he just uses a ring to attack him. He throws him back in. Uh, here we go. Catch with the scissors and into a, like an axe kick by Ricky Steamboat. I love the sell-off that where it's not a clean bump. And then as he jumps off that, that bottom buckle to give himself a little extra height and a little bit of advantage, comes off and gives him a shot where Tully can actually sell it. Uh, in this exchange, if you notice, Ricky hasn't really let go of the ropes. He's, he's giving him backhand chops and stuff like that. He's using the ropes as much as possible because I've talked about this in earlier podcasts, Scott, that we want to make sure that we show that the ropes are a baby face's best friend. Uh, it really puts over the fact that they'll continue to fight even though their body is stopped. Perfect. It's great. I'm going for a pin now. Great pin. Great pin. Hooks that leg. Gets on the chin. So this one is going to be uh, back and forth a little bit as well. We're only five minutes in. Five 13, 14, we're up around that. It's a 13, a 13 and a half minute match. So we're talking, we're talking, it's going to be a little bit more of a contest. It's going to be back and forth. These are the two elite guys of NWA. Sweet chin lock, by the way, nice and tight, no daylight. That means there's no space in that chin lock. It's like, you would never know that he was out. And I love this spot. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. That shows a real desperation. That's a, desperation dirty heel i'm sneaky i don't want to be in there anymore yeah. and that knee is so slick to be hanging off those ropes and throw that knee in there is awesome perfect back suplex tully blanchard is such a legend in professional wrestling and i love tully's work i i, I try to do some Tully stuff. I try not to steal the strut. I don't try when I when I look at guys that I actually really really enjoy. I try not to mimic everything they do. I just like to take some finer points that made them great. So I'm never going to be the guy that struts like Ric Flair or Tully Blanchard, but I certainly am going to take some of the the smooth movements because Tully for a professional wrestler was so smooth, like so smooth on his feet, like the best one of the best workers on the planet. The, uh, um, yeah. You always talk about not rushing and being methodical. And that's what I see with Tully here. Like he's just, everything is very, um, the pace is just seems perfect. Perfect pace. It gives people a, a chance to digest. And he knows that you don't give people a ton of stuff. You give them a little bit and you make it look realistic because in a fight, you're not going to have heat on a guy for 10 minutes and expect him to come back and beat a guy because that would make him look terrible. The idea is to give hopes, even like a bigger hope, as he's just pawing away, he's jabbing away, as you see <laughs> yeah. him circling around. A little slap because, in the of course, head. It's a little slap in the head, but it's also showing the fact that uh, uh, Ricky's exhausted because he can't breathe. He can't get a full breath of air in. So, and he's playing that off. Like, I'm exhausted, and this guy's playing this cat and mouse game of coming in, giving a jab, and getting out. I can watch – hey, Scotty, I can watch this one all day. I've watched this one <laughs> so many times. Oh, but yeah. you can just see the little things in it, even just pawing at his hands. Just He's just a chicken shit, and that's what a heel is. is he, <laughs> yeah. he can be tough. He can be, he, can be, he can be a bad dude. But at the end of the day, he's still going to be a chicken shit. <laughs> that shuffle is awesome. 
Yeah, and of course, as you can see, as you can see, uh, Ricky is not having any of this by this point. He's done. Yeah. He's done. And uh, just the the making of one of the greatest heels, one of the greatest baby faces. How could you not have one of the most perfect matches with these two? Headlock, leapfrog into a beautiful oh. power slam by Ricky Steamboat. Those power slams are so – what do you not see in wrestling anymore? You don't see power slams and you don't see backdrops or atomic drops or slingshots. Or, at, like, these are the type of moves I would love to see people start to bring back. Old is new, people. I keep saying it, and I mean it. Old is new. Double hand chop by Ricky Steamboat. Drives him down to the uh, for with a nice bump. This time, instead of going for that chin lock, he's picking him up. Because if you were looking at the storyline, he's had enough of his nonsense. So he's actually going to beat this man up now. And that's, that's the whole point. Before... He did the baby face way of like using a hold, trying to wear him out, trying to win. Now he's just going to beat him up. And that's that's perfect storytelling right there. That's very subtle, but it's very, very much the best kind of storytelling. I don't know if you've noticed this, Scott, but how many moves have you seen, like actual wrestling moves have you seen so far in this match? And it's nine minutes in. Have you seen that many? Uh I don't know what you mean exactly by that. I mean, the seems like, you know, there's a, I've seen power slam. We've seen a lot of punches and stuff like that. You know, the rib breaker. So yeah, I'm going to say no, not a whole lot. See that exactly. And that's, that's what makes this great is that you don't need a thousand things. You do not need to do all the moves in the world because when they do the moves they hey folks we had a small audio glitch here that i left in so that when it does resume everyone's still at the same spot of the match if you're just listening and not watching along give us a couple seconds the audio will be back shortly count they make the moves count but of course there's lots of wrestling involved with holds and chops and a beautiful power slam and as ricky goes right now for that nice spinning neck breaker that's it we, we, we could count them on one hand right now, what we've seen in the ways of professional wrestling uh, impact moves. Like, um, there will be no Canadian Destroyers in this. There will be no power bombs in this. This is pro wrestling at its best. Right. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Everything that is a move is high impact. Like, it's not twirly shit, and it's just it's high impact stuff that makes sense. Right. And that's the focus. That should be everybody's focus. Everybody focuses so hard on doing moves instead of just focusing on the stuff in between because the stuff in between is the stuff that counts. Uh, you just saw something right there that was one of Tully's moves of death. That was actually his finish at the time was the, the slingshot suplex. So he slings him off the ropes and then goes into the suplex. So Ricky's showing that um, there's two points to that fact that I'd like to make. Is the one is that he's disrespecting Tully now. He's so mad. He's irritated by him. So he's using his own moves. So that's a uh, shot of disrespect. And everybody in that crowd would know this. The second thing involved is when he did go for the cover, he couldn't pin him with it because that's not his move. So even when he pins him, Tully could kick out a two because back then, if it was your signature move, uh, that was your thing. So you perfected it. The idea is you perfected it. Oh, I love that spot. Punches him in the head right there. Sweet. Goes through the back suplex, punches him in the head. Still continues to take that back suplex, but sells uh, the back suplex as well as Ricky sells getting hit with a foreign, uh, foreign object in the top of the skull. And they don't go home with it, which is kind of neat that you would think that would be very predictable that they would go home with it, but they didn't. And then a cross body from Tully, you would think that was it because he just sold the back suplex. So you would think that was the end of the match. That right there, guys, is their false finish right there. Is that a cross body? That cross body is their uh, false finish. Yeah. The old foreign object in the trunks, that's, that uh, needs to come back. Carrying the foreign object in the trunks is awesome. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And why not? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't somebody? Because no referee is going to check that. Nobody's, nobody's going to check in your trunks like that. They'll check your boots over. They'll check your knee pads and the tape. But they're not going to check you inside your trunks. So it's, it's, perfect. it's perfect storytelling at its best. And nobody does it anymore. You're right. Here we are on top. 
big splash. Now, Ricky's not known for doing many high fly moves. So when he busts them out, it's actually such a big deal to me. I love it. Ricky with a big old splash, baby. I love that stuff. Yeah. Here's a sunset flip. I love, love this sunset flip. Oh, going. There it oh. is. There it is. What a and self. there's the finish. There's the finish. In. He so holds up, holds his place with that sunset flip, and then once he does, he holds, he break, he puts on the brakes, uh, and then smashes him with that form or foreign object in the head once more. This really puts across the fact that the first time he had to sell the back suplex. So the idea was the back suplex was being sold, so he couldn't capitalize on the. Uh, the foreign object in the head so he had to go back to the well so he went back to the well the second time and of course uh ricky wouldn't uh, like after that he was in a pinning pos uh position there's no way he's kicking out of it just storytelling at its finest uh professional wrestling looking as real as real can be uh there's not one part of that match that i hate i love everything about that one uh, there, it's almost uh, like a lot of people say that there is no perfect wrestling match. That's one of those ones that you could almost say was perfect because that's almost flawless. What do you think, Scott? What are your well, honest opinion of that bad boy? Yeah, really great match. Uh, and again, back to that finish there. It was, it wasn't overdone when he takes the foreign object out of his trunks and hits him. I literally missed it the first time we I watched that match, and I had to go back and see uh, why ricky acted like he was dead with that shot and it was like it wasn't an overdoing it making it obvious that he's pulling it out of his trunks you had to kind of be paying attention but it lets the it kind of tells the story that the ref might have missed it because it wasn't being super obvious with it so i really liked it brilliant match it's absolutely brilliant uh i encourage you guys to now that you've watched it and listened along with the podcast I, I encourage you to watch that again because you will see so many things in that match it will uh really it'll be a real eye opener for you it's a solid match i love that one yeah perfect storytelling even we, we weren't listening to it with the uh ring announcers but i'm sure they're basically uh putting a little emphasis on what we were seeing there but those guys did such a great job telling the story you didn't need the ring announcers perfect it's absolutely perfect all right um got a question sent in to hammerlock podcast at gmail.com you have time for a couple questions let's do it let's get these questions rolling i'm all about the learning <laughs> All right. First question was, uh, we've heard you talk about the five moves of death. What are the five moves of death? Uh, can you explain that to someone who hasn't heard that before? Oh, yeah. So uh, to me, it's, it would be the WWE system uh, of having your signature moves. So a lot of times when it comes to pro wrestling uh, on the independent scene, so a lot of kids – do a thousand things. You don't have that ability when you're working for the biggest company in the world on TV every week where people see you on the daily. Uh, you can't have repeats of moves. So it's basically uh, a Bret Hart kind of deal, a uh, Triple H kind of deal. Anyone from that era will, it was definitely more uh, prominent where they would have their five set solid signature moves that now that in that five could be their finisher or their finisher could be number six but like take, take a look at bret hart bret hart had the second rope form he had the russian leg sweep he had the sharpshooter as a finish um he had the the bret hart style clothesline where he would actually uh leave he leave his feet and catch you by the neck um, so what it is basically is, uh, they have, a, a bunch of signatures that would be just their stuff. So triple H is another example. Triple H, uh, focused a lot around the knees. So he did a big knee drop that he rolled out of. He did the high knee jumping high knee. He did the knee smash where he went for the back body drop. He got you with the knee. Uh, his pedigree was his finisher. Uh, and probably the sledgehammer. No, I just, I'm just, I, that's a joke. But um, the, it's, it's basically you set yourself up to have a certain uh, signature style of moves so nobody either copies them so they don't see it so many times in a night or they don't oversee them uh, during all the shows. So, like, if 
if my move was Jake Roberts DDT. So if Jake Roberts is on a show and his is a DDT, nobody else is using that DDT or the short arm clothesline that he used to do. He used to do a ring the arm and then pull the guy into a clothesline. Those were his moves. So nobody else on that card would do that out of respect for him, his character and his move set. And so that's that's so you just keep the action going uh, seamlessly, flawlessly, and without uh, nonstop repetitive stuff. Because if you go to an independent show right now, and don't tell me you don't see it, you'll see a thousand DVDs, you'll see a thousand Canadian destroyers, you'll see a thousand super kicks, you'll see a uh, nonstop repeat of moves. And so that's their way of getting rid of all that stuff. Right on. That answers that question. One more quick one, if you have time. Uh, you mentioned in podcast episode number three that you worked for All Japan Pro Wrestling. What was the nature of your work there, and how was All Japan Pro to work for as a company? Yeah, I went to, I went over on tour. I was there for two weeks uh, with All Japan. I was the foreign guy, as they're called gaijin, which is not a good term. If you flip that into Japanese and translate it over, it's not a nice term. So we'll just leave it at that. But <laughs> what it, all it is, I like the, the, the polite way of saying it is you're a foreigner. You're a foreigner to their soil, so they want you to come over and have a different style. Now, being said, that being said, working with All Japan was uh, like a dream come true for me because I'm a huge All Japan pro wrestling fan, especially in the late 80s, mid 90s. That era was so great uh, for wrestling and All Japan. Um, so it was, it was such an honor to be there. The one thing that I, uh, I will give advice to on kids nowadays that want to pursue this and have the opportunity to go to Japan is um, a lot of our styles are now homogenized, where it means we're all just white milk. We all do the same stuff, very repetitive, like I just said. Um, nobody really breaks uh, from any certain kind of style. Everything's very much the same. If you're a submission guy you can do submissions but yet you can do kicks and you can brawl and yet you can do a high fly it's ridiculous pick some like i would i would suggest you find your own niche your own your own style and if you have the opportunity if you're fortunate enough to get over to a company like all japan and work for that that great company even still to this day when you go there be you don't try to wrestle like you're japanese that's not the reason you're there because if they wanted another Japanese professional wrestler, they would just go down the street because Tokyo is full of independent wrestling. Now they would go down the street and they would get another Japanese wrestler to do what they do because they don't need that. When you come over there, they're at wanting a North American style or a Mexican style. They want something that is not their style. And the problem I see a lot of times even my first time, even my first time going there is I tried to do their style. Hindsight is, you know, 2020. Mm -hmm. I learned from it after my first uh, tour of zero one. But uh, when you go over there, if you have the chance, don't, don't do their stuff, man. Do you be you give American flair, a North American feel to it, a nice vibe that is truly yours and work within the parameters of their style. That's the best way I could throw it out there. Right on. That's solid advice. And where were you in Tokyo the whole time? We were in Tokyo. Uh, I did. I know I was in a town that Tokyo for a couple shows and then we, we toured outside and I'm sorry for like, I apologize to everybody. I don't even know half the towns I went to. I know that uh, we were supposed to go to, we were near Mount Fuji. So if anybody's uh, familiar with Japan, because I know a lot of them are, um, we did, I did get to see Mount Fuji on the way and we did some touring out that way in the smaller communities. Um, and it was kind of neat. I, lo I, I love, I love going like on the highways and stuff like that on their tour bus was great. It was a great experience um, because you get to just see, see a whole different kind of scenery and like uh, infrastructure of like going through tunnels and stuff. Like they're just so advanced in a lot of different ways. Um, infrastructure wise, it was, it was a, and it's a beautiful countryside. If you ever had the chance to go, 
I do encourage you to go and just pay attention to everything, not just be consumed like me with pro wrestling. Um, go outside and check it out. Check out the city. It's beautiful. Cool. And being, you know, over a decade ago, I'm sure people will uh, forgive you for not remembering the exact cities that you're in. Um, you had one more quick thing. You mentioned about turning your back. You got a story about turning your back on your opponent. Oh, see, Scotty, that's why I, I love you, man. You, you know me too well. I'd forget <laughs> that in a heartbeat if you didn't bring that up. I wrote it down. So, so I've mentioned many times I, I do some tutorials online through our YouTube site uh, that the podcast is on. Uh, I do tutorials and I did mention it and I didn't give any explanation, but there was one time early in my career where I, I was a young fella and I was working for border city wrestling, a young kid where, where they were just giving me a singles push. Um, and this is just before I started working enhancements for WWE. And so before the air Canada center story, I started working a year before that with Terry Taylor, the red rooster, as you know, him, Taylor made man, one of the uh, legends of professional wrestling, one of the greatest coaches that WWE has right now, just a phenomenal mind for business understands his business more than anybody. Um, and really gets it really, really gets it. And a great worker at to boot. So Terry Taylor and I were locked into this feud for over a year. So my learning really happened with Terry because Terry didn't teach me moves. I went to school. I learned to bump. I learned moves. Once I was done school, uh, I had no idea how to put it all together. Terry's the one that really helped me on my way to learn how to put stuff together. So the first match we're in together, I do this silly dance that I was known for back then. I'm doing this goofy dance. I'm playing to the crowd. I'm always on the crowd. I turn my back completely away from Terry. I'm jawing with the crowd, being a baby face, saying, I'll get him. I'll get that chicken. I'll get him. Uh, and in that time, Terry Taylor smashes me in the back of the head <laughs> so hard, so hard that I see white. So, you know, when you get a, a, a good stinger right in the back of the head, that's what <laughs> Terry gave me. He slapped me in the back of the head so hard. And then when I turned around and looked at him, he was doing the kind of the Tully Blanchard shuffle around the ring and under his breath, he says, don't you turn your back on me, son. And I remember him <laughs> chuckling, to, <laughs> chuckling to himself as he had just smacked the ever living shit out of me uh as a way of learning me and that's that's what how, like sometimes kids need to learn and that's the best way to teach them you know is give them a spanking basically um not really used very much nowadays because a lot of sensitive people would be up in arms over that but back in the day it's one of the best moments of my whole career is i've learned now then, and I, as I know now, you never turn your back on an opponent. And it's probably the best way to learn a kid and smarten them up real quick. Yeah, that's a good lesson you'll never forget. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful lesson. It's a beautiful lesson. And it's done by one of the greatest of all time. And I just, I can, it's got, it, it's so profound with me. It's such a profound spot that I still, to this day, can see him as I turn around, shuffling around that ring, smirking and giggling <laughs> under, <laughs> under his breath, saying, don't turn your back on me, son. It was one of the highlights, and it will always be one of my fondest memories of professional wrestling. That's awesome. That's a great story. Uh, all right, anything else on the match we just watched or anything else we talked about before we sign off for the day? That's it. Just yeah, give it a go. Like I said a little earlier on, just watch it. Please watch it uh, through on this podcast and then watch it for yourself and just enjoy like uh, per perfect, perfect storytelling at its best. Right on. Lad, well, we'll do it for this episode. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you're listening on YouTube, you can leave any comments, questions down below. Uh, if you're listening on a podcast network, you can always hit us up on Twitter at Tyson Dukes or at Hammerlock Pod. Send any questions you have to hammerlockpodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, we will catch you later. Bye.